Colorado, the price of pot, in fact, this uh, story in the Financial Times right now, demand puts premium on recreational marijuana prices in Colorado. And uh, the, the price of pot is skyrocketing because of demand. More and more people want to buy it. Uh, surprise, surprise. I mean, this is how marketplaces work. And the, the law had specified only, you know, I think it's 70% of what you grow has to go to the medical market. And so, or maybe it's 70% can go to the recreational because I can't scroll down because my screen has frozen. For some reason, when I tried to read this page, ah, something's gone wrong. Okay. In any case, the uh, Financial Times website is getting a little flaky here. Um, but uh, what do you do? How do you, how do you handle these things in marketplaces that you do find some societal value in regulating in some way? Right, I mean, we do it with alcohol, and apparently alcohol taxes are low enough that bootlegging is not a big problem, smuggling is not a big problem. Alcohol, about 50,000 people die every year in the United States from, uh, directly from alcohol. Around another 35,000 die every year indirectly from, from the use of alcohol. Uh, the number of people who've di died from the use of uh, recreational marijuana or even medicinal marijuana in the last 100 years is zero as far as we can tell. So you would think that that would be a you know something you want to regulate or, or you know regulate even more lightly perhaps than than alcohol, but tobacco, about five hundred thousand Americans and many more millions around the planet, but between four and five hundred thousand Americans will die of tobacco use this year, and this is and so you know states try to regulate this and try to discourage the use of it by raising taxes on it. And when you get big disparities, like in Washington State, where you've got a three dollar uh, per pack tax, and then um, Idaho, where it's fifty seven cents or something like that, uh, you get a uh, a smuggling problem, basically. So what do you do about it? JD JD Tuchelli is with us, the managing editor of Reason dot com and Reason twenty four seven Reason dot com Reason magazine, uh, on the line with us. Hey JD, how you doing? All right. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I wanted to get the libertarian take on this. Tobacco is the only product, to the best of my knowledge, maybe you know of something else, uh, it's the only product sold in the United States legally that when used as directed causes death. Well, some people would say the same about certain kinds of food, but I think we could all agree that tobacco is not the best thing for you. Uh, Health-wise, it certainly isn't. Whatever pleasures a lot of people may derive from it. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of health uh, issues related to tobacco consumption, no doubt about that. So, in a, in a libertarian world, what do you do? Well, I think you let people make their own decisions and uh, shoulder the, uh, the health you know, uh, results of the decisions they make, whether it's tobacco consumption, their diets, um, sedentary versus active lifestyle, um, very active lifestyle that might have its own risks. Um, you know, we all make choices. But those decisions, those decisions require a certain level of information. I mean, for a, for a marketplace to work in the in the way that that uh, you know Adam Smith might have envisioned, um, you have to have not only a perfect marketplace, but you have to have perfect information. Parties and counterparties have to have perfect information. And well, if you've got tobacco true. companies we'll no, marketing no, sorry, I, a, an addictive and poisonous product to children with the cartoon characters, that's not a perfect information marketplace. And a lot of these tobacco taxes are used to pay for advertising to point out to people how destructive tobacco is. So, you know, it's an attempt to keep a marketplace open for an addictive drug that, that is destructive. You know, you could argue, I suppose, that tobacco produces some sort of euphoria. I, I think, you know, as a former smoker myself, my experience was that that was only true for the first few weeks. Um, and after that, it only produces withdrawal symptoms. But um, whatever, I mean, if how, how do you, how, if, how, do, how are you going to provide for that perfect information if you don't charge a tax on the tobacco to pay to provide it? I don't know that many economists argue you need perfect information. I bet you need information for sure. 
and we've seen smoking rates decline as it's become um, you know common knowledge that it's not good for you. I mean, the old claims that you saw back in the 20s and 30s that was actually helpful to smoke are, are something that would be considered less. It wasn't just the 20s and the 30s. I remember in the 60s watching Ronald Reagan dressed up like a doctor on television saying that Palmell's, more doctors smoke Palmell's when they have a sore throat or, or a cold than any other. I mean, I, you know, I, I remember that. Maybe it was the late 50s. Um, but yeah, anyhow, it was, it's in my lifetime that happened. Well, yeah, and those are laughable claims now. I mean, people, we point to those and you know, we make fun of them rightfully because uh, they're nonsense. We know they're nonsense. So that you don't need perfect information. You don't need to know exactly that, uh, what tobacco does to you to know that it's not good for you. And we've seen smoking rates decline. Will they go away completely? I mean, uh, I don't know that. People but one of the things that we do know is that, is that the use of tobacco causes an increase in all of our expenses as a consequence of a lack of productivity, um, you know, death and disease associated with that, and the cause to public health of people who smoke who are not insured and getting smoke, smoking-related diseases. So if, those, if, it's causing, if, this product, if the use of this product is costing us money, if the externality of the tobacco industry is that we are all having to pay these extra expenses, Shouldn't we capture that externality with taxes? Well, you can make the same argument about almost every lifestyle choice we make, though. I mean, that could be everything from hang gliding to sedentary lifestyles to a bad diet. Uh, we, you know, when people make choices that are non-optimal all the time. All of us do. I don't think. But wait a minute. Are you saying that a product a that, that when a product is sold and it produces an externality that is measurable and monetizable, you know, like for example, you know, pumping poisonous gas into the atmosphere while you're refining gasoline that that the society should not be able to recover the cost of that or that the oil company shouldn't at least pay for the cost of that externality except that you're, you're assuming that societies have, are, have to necessarily assume those costs now you were talking about uh, workplace productivity um, that's uh, that's something that we all make you know if we wake up in the morning with a hand productivity and, and the cost and medical be. costs excuse me and medical costs well, medical costs are also related to everything else. You can wake up in the morning, you can drink too much, you can eat a poor diet. None of us. We, we pay lifestyle. for we you know we tax drinking heavily enough to cover the cost of that externality, at least in theory. Well, ex- except I'm not sure that your employer would say the same thing. Those taxes are going to the government. Your employer loses the productivity. You show up uh, nursing a hangover the next day. The costs are spread in a lot of different areas, and none of us lives an optimal lifestyle. Those costs are all over the place. Okay. When you talk about taxes, you're talking about the government taking that money. And the government may uh, may offset some externalities, but externalities go all over the place. Just- okay. J.D., we're, we're out of time. Hang on just a second. This is the Tom Hartman Program. J.D. Tuchelli, the uh, managing editor, Reason.com, Reason 24-7. You can read it over at Reason.com. Thanks, J.D. Thanks for having me on.